This topic is about cathode rays and uh, cathode ray oscilloscope. But before we go to the cathode ray oscilloscope, which is the final section of the topic, would like to look at uh, cathode rays and uh, the cathode ray tube. So by the end of this video lecture, you will be able to describe properties of a cathode rays, describe features of the cathode ray oscilloscope, and describe the use of the cathode ray oscilloscope. So before we delve deeper into the cathode ray oscilloscope, we would like to consider the following questions. What are cathode rays? How are they produced? Can we be able to describe the features of the cathode ray tube in terms of why is the tube evacuated? What is the function of the anode or anodes because it's got two anodes? How is the speed of electrons increased or are decreased? How is the number of electrons produced per unit time increased or decreased? These are some of the questions which we want to address in the production of cathode rays. But first of all, what are cathode rays? Cathode rays are simply fast moving electrons. They are electrons which are in motion. Probably they are moving in a straight path and they are moving very fast. When you have electrons which are in motion and they are moving very fast, we refer to them as cathode rays rays. Now it's important to note that although we are using the term rays, you might get the idea that cathode rays are like waves. They are like light. They are not wave. They are not wave-like. They are not the same as light. In fact, they are particles. But light, the way we know it, it doesn't have mass in kilograms, for example. Besides, cathode rays are charged and light is not. So, when we look at properties of cathode rays, we'll be able to bring out these distinctions. Especially when we say that cathode rays travel in straight lines, light also travels in straight lines. We'd like to know a bit of distinction there so that we don't confuse between light and cathode rays. Although we talk about light rays, we, call, we talk about cathode rays. The use of the word rays may bring in the idea that cathode rays are the same as light, they are waves. They are not the same as light and they are not waves. Now, because we have already said that they are fast moving electrons, let's look at a few facts about uh, the electron. First of all, the electron is one of the fundamental particles of an atom. There are three fundamental particles in an atom. One of them is the electron. The other two are the proton and the neutrons. The protons and the neutrons, they reside, they, they are found in the center part of the atom in a region we refer to as the nucleus. And then surrounding the nucleus, we've got the electrons, which orbit the nucleus. They carry a negative charge. I'm talking about the electrons. They carry a negative charge whose magnitude is 1.6 by 10 raised to power minus 19 coulombs. This is referred to as the fundamental charge. Uh, in fact, it is the smallest charge that is possible that can exist all by itself and the charge will occur in multiples of this value 1.6 by 10 raised to minus 19 coulombs so let's appreciate here at this moment that they carry a negative charge protons on the other hand carry a positive charge and because they are particles they carry a mass of 9.11 by 10 raised to minus 931 kilograms. Very light compared to the proton. And we will revisit this area when we look at the deflection of these particles in electric fields. So, how are cathode rays produced? Cathode rays are produced from metal surfaces when the metal surface is heated above a particular temperature. 
the, proce the process of producing electrons from a metal surface when the metal is heated is referred to as thermionic emission. Let's look at this word. It's got the word thermo, which means heat or temperature, and then ionic, which means charged particles. So emission of charged particles from a metal surface when the metal surface is heated is referred to as thermionic emission. There are two processes by which electro electrons can be emitted from the surface of a metal. One of them is thermionic emission. The other one is photoelectric emission of photoelectric effect. The fact that when we take light, we shine it on certain metal surfaces, then electrons are going to be emitted from that metal surface. This is the business of a different topic altogether referred to as photoelectric effect. So let's go back to thermionic em emission. Thermionic emission occurs in a cathode ray tube, a special tube which we are going to study in a moment, referred to as the cathode ray tube, which or CRT, which forms the basis of the CRO, the cathode ray oscilloscope. So let's go right ahead and study the cathode ray tube. This is how the cathode ray tube looks like. It has got this glass envelope which is completely closed and it is evacuated. That is, all air has been removed from inside this glass envelope. Now why do we find it necessary to remove all air from the inside of this glass envelope? We do that so that we can prevent the electrons which we produce from colliding with, with air molecules. Air molecules are very heavy compared to the mass of an electron. So if an electron co collides with an, an air molecule, it will lose all its kinetic energy and will not be able to use such an electron. So, in order to prevent collision of electrons with air molecules, we remove all the air from inside this glass envelope. So, it is a vacuum. So, one of the questions is, why do we find it necessary to evacuate this uh, cathode ray tube? It is in order to prevent collision between electrons and air molecules. Next. We've got this wire here and a heater at the end of here. This heater is responsible for heating this metal structure here. And this metal structure is referred to as the cathode. The cathode, when heated, it's going to produce electrons by the process of thermionic emission. So we connect a small voltage here, about 6 volts. It can be DC or AC, about 6 volts very small voltage. The moment it heats up this heater, the heater hits the cathode, the cathode produces electrons by thermionic emission. Those electrons, the moment they are produced, they don't have much speed. Probably they will just remain on the surface of the cathode. So we need to accelerate them. We need to give them some speed. And we can only do that by putting them in an electric field. So we create an electric field between this metal and this one by connecting this ring to a high positive potential. And then the negative potential is connected to the cathode. So that as soon as the electrons are produced, they are going to be repelled by the negative potential on the cathode and attracted by the positive potential on the anode. In other words, there is an electric field here. What is an electric field? It is a region where a charged particle experiences a force. And it experiences a force in the direction of electric field lines. And electric field lines usually point from the, positively, the positive charge or the positive metal plate here. And they go to the negative plate. So if you, you put a positively charged particle here, it will move in the direction of the electric field lines. That means 
a negatively charged particle will move in the opposite direction. And remember, we are talking about a negatively charged particle, which is the electron. So it will move in this direction. The electric field, and this one is very important, the electric field is going to do work on the electron. The amount of work done by the electric field on the electron is converted into the kinetic energy of the electron. So that increase in kinetic energy, it will obviously uh, translate to the fact that the electron will, ha will have a very high speed by the time it reaches the anode. Now I'd like you to observe that the anode is in the form of a ring and the electron is somewhere around here and it is being attracted. So it is being attracted in all directions. So it ends up moving in a straight line without approaching any of the sides of the ring. And by the time it reaches here, it's got such a high speed, a speed like 10 raised to power 5 meters per second, that it just shoots through. It will not strike the edges of the metal plate because it is being attracted from all sides by that ring. So the function of this anode is to accelerate the electron, to accelerate the electron, because the, the extra high tension or the high voltage be, between the anode and the cathode creates an electric field which does work on the electron or which attracts the electron in this direction, increasing its speed. So one of the functions of this anode is to accelerate the electron. There are two anodes, anode one and anode two. The second anode has got a different function. Now I'd like you to remember that the, uh, the electrons are charged particles. They are negatively charged and they are moving in the same direction. And then you remember another law the basic law of electrostatics, which states that like charges will repel. So these electrons are going to repel each other as they travel. And therefore, as they travel, they are going to dilate outwards like that. They are going to move separate. They are go going to move away from each other. We don't want that one to happen because we want these electrons to strike the screen because over here, this is a screen. It's coated with a material which fluoresces. I'm going to go to that in a moment. This is the screen. When they strike the screen, we want the electrons to strike the screen at a single point. But the moment you produce these electrons here, they move in all sorts of directions because of the repulsion. So you want to force them to come closer together. And this is done by connecting a positive potential here, which is less than this positive potential. So it will act like a negative potential because it is lower than this positive potential here. What it does is to repel the electrons so that now the electrons now come closer together. They are forced to come closer together. You can think about a ring which is being tightened around the electrons, forcing them to come closer together. And before they can start repelling each other again, they will have reached the screen. So the second anode serves to focus the electrons onto the screen. So the anode serves two functions, to accelerate the electrons and to focus the electrons onto the screen. And in our next, after the break, in the next uh, lecture, we are going to look at how we are going to modify this cathode ray tube uh, so that it forms the cathode ray oscilloscope. But before we go to that, I'd like you to appreciate the fact that uh, these electrons, when they hit the screen over here, they make the screen to fluoresce. To fluoresce is to produce light. You see these electrons, by the time they strike the screen, and by the way, the moment they shoot out 
of this last anode here, they will be moving in a straight line like bullets. So this section here, all the way from the heater, cathode, first anode, second anode, is referred to as the electron gun. Electron gun. It is used to shoot electrons straight like that. When these electrons travel here, they've got uniform speed. Remember over here, they were being accelerated, so the speed was increasing. But as soon as they move out of this electron gun, they've got uniform speed. So they are moving with uniform speed all the way to the screen. And because they are in motion, they have some speed, they've got kinetic energy. The moment they hit the screen, that kinetic energy is immediately converted into light energy by the material which coats the inside of this glass envelope. It is zinc sulfide. Zil zinc sulfide is the same material which coats the inside of, the, of an old television uh, tube. Because old television sets are simply cathode ray tubes. On the inside is zinc sulfide. When the electrons hit the screen, especially when the, uh, the, the TV is not receiving any TV station, you'll be able to see so many dots on the screen. Each one of those dots on the screen of an old television set is an electron hitting the screen and then it fluoresces, it produces light. Remember that. So you can now imagine how many electrons are hitting the screen per unit time. And while we are on that, I'd like to move to a section whereby I want to consider how we can increase the number of electrons which are being produced here per unit time because it will determine the number of electrons which will reach the screen per unit time and therefore increasing or decreasing the brightness. You see, if you want to increase the brightness over here, you will increase the number of electrons which are hitting the screen per unit time. How do you do that? You increase the heater current. If you increase this, the, if you put a potentiometer here which varies the amount of current, current which goes to the heater, then you are increasing or decreasing the heater current. If you increase the heater current, the number of electrons produced by thumb ionic emission per unit time will increase. That means the number of electrons reaching the screen here will also increase and therefore the brightness will increase. So the brightness control knob on the cathode ray tube or an, a television set or even the cathode ray oscilloscope is connected to the heater current. So you can do that by varying the heater current. The next part is how do you change the speed of these electrons? How do you increase or decrease the speed of the electrons? We do that by changing the high voltage between the anode and the cathode. When you increase this voltage, you're going to do more work on the electrons Therefore, the kinetic energy gained by the electrons will be much, much higher. And that means the speed that they gain will be much, much higher. So, sometimes we do put a grid between the cathode and the anode. A metal grid, more like a fine mesh wire. And then we connect a negative potential to that mesh wire. When you connect a negative potential to that a mesh wire, it will help to repel those electrons which don't have a lot of speed, a lot of kinetic energy. Because these electrons, depending on the speed with which they are emitted from the metal surface or their orientation, they might have a different, we might have electrons with different speeds. All of them don't have the same speed. So we might want to repel those electrons with lower speed. And therefore, we put a mesh there, which is referred to as the grid. So the grid repels those slow electrons. So that again, once you remove them from 
uh, this uh, from the rest, then the number of electrons uh, reaching the screen is going to reduce definitely. So again, there are two methods that you can control the number of electrons with, uh, which are reaching the screen. You can control using the heater current or you can control that using the voltage connected to the grid. So somewhere between the, an the cathode and the first anode here is the grid is the grid and those are the simple facts we can look at one more thing inside this cathode ray tube we have said that it is totally a vacuum so as the electrons move remember they are very tiny you can't be able to see them you'll only be able to see what their effect here you won't be able to see them but suppose we wanted to see the path of those electrons. We can introduce a gas which will glow when charged particles pass through the gas, such as argon. We can introduce argon at low, at low pressure inside here. Of course, there will be that aspect of the fact that uh, there will be, we are going to increase the collisions, but our aim is to make the path of the electrons to be visible so we can introduce argon at low pressure in order to be able to see the electrons the path of the electrons as they move all the way from the cathode and they hit the screen here and remember this glass envelope is transparent it's transparent it's like the the a torch bulb so that you can even be able to see the inside so inside there, you'll see a fine line travel like that all the way to the screen. And then using that fine line now, we can be able to play around with it. We can introduce an external electric field and be able to see how uh, it gets deflected. We can be able to introduce a magnetic field also to see how the deflection of those electrons occur. That is the business of the next is section when we will be looking at the cathode ray oscilloscope. So let's go for a short break and when we come back we'll be looking at the cathode ray oscilloscope. Okay, welcome back. Before we look at how the cathode ray works, I think it is important we look at properties of cathode rays. There's some, just something that I want to point out in the last a uh, diagram that I used in the video, mm -hmm. I should have indicated these um, um, uh, the way the positives and the negatives of the batteries are con connected. For example, over here there is a six volt, either AC or DC. That one is not a problem. But when it comes to the extra high tension, the ex the voltage between the anode and the cathode which is which ranges from about 2 kilovolts to about 5 kilovolts is connected between this there is a wire connected to the cathode and the other one connected to the anode so that voltage is connected over here and the higher the voltage uh, that is the higher the accelerating potential the higher the speed of the electrons which emerge from there then this second anode is connected to a positive potential fine but its positive potential is less than this one so that it can behave like a negative potential which is going to repel electrons and therefore force them to come closer together. Those are the points which I wanted to emphasize here. Otherwise, let us go to the first property of this cathode rays. The first property is that cathode rays travel in straight lines and we can do an experiment to prove this. All we need to do is to put an object on its path. Traditionally, a Maltese cross was used. This Maltese cross was put in the path of the cathode rays and you find that a shadow was cast at this point. Remember that the fact that light casts a shadow is proof that light travels in a straight line. So anything which can cast a shadow must be traveling in a straight line. So 
there will be a shadow of these multi-scrolls on the screen here. So the, those sections of the screen which will not be illuminated, it means that they, the electrons have been stopped by the Maltese cross, which is here. So it is just as simple as that. Use a Maltese cross to cast a shadow of the cross on the screen, and you will have proved that cathode rays travel in a straight line. The other property is that cathode rays are deflected by electric and magnetic fields. Let's study deflection of cathode rays by electric fields. How can we create an electric field? An electric field is created by having two metal plates which are parallel to each other. Two metal plates which look like that. One above the other. And they are parallel to each other. And then a battery is connected or a potential is connected across the plates. Let's suppose that this has got a positive potential. It's connected to the positive side of a battery. And this one is connected to the negative side of the battery. We know that the positive side of the battery has a deficiency of electrons. So what it will do is that it will remove electrons from this metal plate. So the metal plate which was initially neutral is going to lose electrons. And what do we know about neutral bodies? When they lose electrons, they become positively charged. So this plate here will acquire positive charge. The plate connected to the negative terminal of the battery becomes negatively charged because while this terminal of the battery, the positive side, acts like a suction pump, it sucks electrons from that plate, this one, the negative terminal of the same battery acts like a pump for the electrons. It pumps electrons onto this plate. It adds electrons onto a plate which was initially neutral. And again, remember, when a neutral body gains electrons, it becomes negatively charged. So that is how this plate becomes negatively charged, and this one becomes positively charged. So there will be an electric field between the two plates. And we usually represent electric field lines with arrows which point from the positive plate to the negative plate. So these white lines that you can see here, they represent an electric field. And the fact that the lines are uniformly spaced tells us that that is a uniform electric field. In other words, its strength is uniform throughout. Now, when electrons, when a beam of electrons starting from the cathode travels all the way up to this point, it is traveling in a straight line. By the moment it enters an electric field, remember it is negatively charged, it's going to experience a force towards the positive plate because itself it is negatively charged. So it's going to be attracted upwards like that in a direction which is opposite to the direction of the electric field lines. But if it was positively charged, it will be, it will experience a force in the direction of the electric field. So that point is very clear. Now because it has momentum, it will not move this way. It will continue moving horizontally as well as upwards. So eventually it ends up curving like that, curving like that. And the moment it leaves the electric field, it will travel in a straight line. In a straight line. Remember, in the absence of any other field which makes these electrons to, which applies a force on the electron, the electrons will always travel in a straight line. We have just seen that from the first property, that these electrons, these cathode rays travel in straight lines. So the moment those electrons come out of this field, they will move in a straight line. Another point is this. Over here, between the cathode and the anode, the electric field does work on the electrons, and the work done is converted into kinetic energy, and that is how the electrons gain speed. Similarly, 
when the electrons come over here because of this force, they will continue with the speed which they had when they entered the electric field horizontally. That horizontal component of the velocity will remain the same as when they entered the field. So the horizontal component of the velocity here will be the same as the speed they have here. So the horizontal velocity remains the same, but vertically it gains another velocity. So it has two velocities. Uh, it has, uh, its velocity has two components. There is the horizontal component and there is the vertical component. When you combine the horizontal and the vertical component, you find that the velocity of the particle is this way and it is greater in magnitude compared to the velocity with which it enters the electric field. Reason being, the electric field has done work on it. It's important to appreciate this fact that the electric field is doing work on the electrons. Why? We will discover that when it comes to the magnetic field, the magnetic field will not do work on the electron and therefore its speed will not change. It's only its direction which will change. So, but when it comes to the electric field, the electric field does work on the charge and therefore the charge gains more kinetic energy. So the kinetic energy the electron has here is more than the kinetic energy it has here because of the extra work done on the electron by the electric field here. And that means it's proof that this velocity will be larger in magnitude compared to that velocity. Very, very important. Now, it is at this point that I bring in a proton. If we were to accelerate an electron and a proton, they will gain the same speed. Uh, actually, actually, the work done on each one of them will be the same because they've got the same magnitude of the charge. It's only that one is positive, the other one is negative. But the magnitude is the same. So the work done on the proton is equal to the work done on the electron. But because the, uh, the proton is much, much heavier, the speed it will gain by the time it's here is uh, much less compared to the speed gained by the electron. So that is a fact. If the accelerating potential remains the same for both of them. Now, I want you to consider a situation where they are entering this electric field with the same speed. Let's call it velocity because they are moving in the same direction and the magnitude is the same. So they've got the same velocity. But the proton, there will be two differences here. The proton will be deflected downwards while the electron is deflected as shown. Reason being, the proton is positively charged and the electron is negatively charged. So that's why the proton will be deflected downwards. The other point we will observe is that the electron undergoes more deflection compared to the, to the proton. In, uh, that is, it undergoes more turning compared to the proton because of its very small mass. The electron compared to the proton is very, very light and therefore it is easily uh, deflected compared to the proton which is much, much heavier. In fact, the, pro the proton is about 1,800 times heavier compared to the electron and therefore it undergoes and therefore the proton undergoes less deflection compared to the electron. Those are some of the changes we can uh, be able to uh, bring over here. Another uh, observation we can make is this. Let's go back to the deflection of the electron. <clears throat> and uh, forget about the deflection of the proton. 
So we have the electron. It is deflected this way. Suppose we were to reverse the terminals of this battery, making the lower plate to be positive, the upper plate to be negative. That electron will be deflected downwards. So if we connect, at one time we connect this one to the positive, negative, and then negative, positive, the deflection will be either up or down. So if we connect a voltage which is changing from positive to negative, positive to negative, we'll be able to observe this spot jump from that point to this point, back to this point, to this point, back to the same point, over and over again at the frequency of that changing voltage. Next, the amount of deflection. You see this amount of deflection? Let me just assume that there is a line here. There is a line here all the way up to this point. This is the amount of yeah. deflection. This deflection depends on how much voltage on the potential difference between the plates. If we decrease the potential difference between the plates, a series of events will take place. One of them is that the electric field strength will reduce. That means the force on the electron is going to reduce. And if the force on the electron reduces, the amount of deflection is going to be less. So, by reducing the potential difference across the plates, we are going to reduce the amount of deflection. If we make the potential difference between the plates to be zero, then that electron will not be deflected at all. It will hit the center of the screen at that point. So, several things come into mind here. That if we connect a potential between, the potential between the two plates. And by the way, at this point, because these plates are connected this way and they help to deflect the electrons up and down along the y-axis, these plates are referred to as the y-plates. Of course, we do have the x-plates which are connected this way and they help to deflect the electron horizontally or along the x-axis. This one's deflect the electron along the y-axis, along the y-axis. Now, let me go back to the point where I was saying, suppose the voltage between the two y-plates is such that it is an alternating voltage, what you call AC voltage. Let's call it alternating voltage. Alternating voltage is voltage which is changing in magnitude and we have seen what happens when we change the magnitude of the voltage across the plates. It affects the amount of deflection. Alternating voltage is voltage which is changing in direction and we have seen what happens when we reverse the, the connections to the plates. If we reverse the connection to the plates the direction of the deflection is changed. So, if we connect an alternating voltage with maybe a frequency of about 5 Hz, very, very low frequency, this is what we, we will observe. We will observe a spot which is turn, starts from the middle, moves all the way to the maximum, reduces, comes back to zero, overshoots that point, moves in the opposite direction, reaches here, and then comes back to the starting point when that alternating voltage makes one complete oscillation. That is what we will be able to see. A spot which starts from the middle, progressively moves all the way to the maximum point, comes back to zero, overshoots that, moves all the way to the point at the bottom here, and then comes back to the center position, ready to repeat that process once again. If we increase the frequency of that alternating voltage, what do you think will happen? That spot now will start moving faster. 
we can move like that like that if we increase the frequency it will keep on moving up and down up and down if we connect a voltage whose frequency is equivalent to the to the frequency from the mains which is about 50 hertz then that spot will move up and down so fast that it will appear to be stationary and we'll just see a vertical line so i hope you've been able to follow that discussion if you're having a problem with that of if you want to get it straight just replay this video and you'll be able to see the way i have outlined those ideas so again i want us to take a break here before we look at the next property which is the fact that these cathode rays are deflected by a magnetic field in this section we have just looked at the fact that they travel in straight lines and they are deflected by an electric field. So see you in a moment.